My name is Tony Roth. Tony Roth, I'm the chair of the Grand Rounds Committee. Today is a special day because it's the first um, John S. Sullivan Memorial Lecture in neuropsychiatry. We'll hear a little bit more about in a few minutes. Just as a reminder, Grand Rounds are both in person and on Zoom, and lunch will be provided to people who come in person. For those who come in person, you must have an active working badge in order to get into Grand Rounds. Please keep your mask on when you are not uh, eating. To receive credit for attending today, please, for those of you on Zoom, please complete the evaluation in the survey monkey, survey monkey that came with the Grand Rounds announcement from Karen Lambert this past Monday. If you are in the room, there are sign-in sheets over there on the table. For those of you on Zoom, please type questions for the speaker in the chat, and um, Dr. Benjamin will ask the speaker the question. Next week, we ran around on September 29th. We are having uh, several guests who are going to talk about the new medical school this uh, curriculum. It will be Dr. Patricia uh, Seymour and several of her uh, uh, colleagues. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sheldon Benjamin, who's the Vice Chair for Education and Professor of Psychiatry and Neurology. We'll talk to you a little bit about Dr. Sullivan and who is today's speaker. Thanks, Tony. I gotta say, this is uh, my first time being at in-person Grand Rounds since 2000, since early 2020, because I was traveling very much too. And it's pretty weird. Uh, so um, there we go. Well, um, today we are pleased to inaugurate a new lecture series in memory of our beloved colleague, John Sullivan. John was a second year UMass Chan med student uh, when he approached me after a lecture to ask me what would be the first of many unanswerable but fascinating questions that he never stopped asking. <laughs> Two years later, he entered our six-year combined psychiatry and neurology residency program. Uh, and when he graduated, we arranged to loan him to Brigham and Women's Hospital for five years. But then we called him alone in 2017 uh, when John sort of was hinting that he would be open to coming back. And uh, uh, to our great celebration, he came back and joined us, uh, working on some of the units that uh, he loved so much, and then eventually becoming medical director of our med site in the East. Uh, in June of this year, when we lost John to cancer, his wife, T.C., who's over here, uh, expressed John's wish that we consider creating a memorial lectureship in his name. Um, and I also understand that uh, this Saturday would have been John's 52nd birthday, so it's kind of a birthday celebration, too. To inaugurate the Sullivan Lectureship in Neuropsychiatry, we can think of no better speaker than John's colleague, David Perez. David majored in neuroscience and behavior at Columbia University, attended NYU Medical School, and then did his internship there. Came to Boston and undertook neurology residency with the MGH Partners Program, and then psychiatry residency with the Longwood Psychiatry Program. He didn't do it the short way like our combined neurology psychiatry residents do. He did it the long way and did two full tilt residencies following one another. Um, and he didn't have enough yet, so then he undertook a uh, master's in medical science investigation sometime after that. And uh, in the decade or so since he completed his training, uh, he's already published over a hundred peer reviewed articles and chapters, uh, won several grants, and established at Mass General the Functional Neurological Disorders Laboratory and the Functional Neurological Disorders Clinic that he leads. Um, he is an in-demand speaker internationally and nationally. Um, in some ways, David is part of a small group that's changing the face of the disorders we be talking about and making it much more of an understood and acceptable condition than it had been previously. Now, it's especially appropriate to have Dr. Perez here, not only because he knew John and was a colleague, 
But because John was also interested in today's topic, functional neurological disorders, and he would tell me from time to time how we weren't quite doing it right and he made suggestions about it, how we could better treat uh, these patients. Today, we're especially pleased to welcome on Zoom many alumni of our program and the greater neuropsychiatry community out there. And, uh, uh, and some of our faculty were on Zoom as well. Uh, in addition, I want to extend a special welcome to uh, John's wife, TC, his children, Jack, Isabel, and uh, Nicholas, who are sitting here, and uh, uh, to his adopted mom, Maurice Sullivan, his biological mom, Sue Showers, his mother-in-law, Mary Haldi, and several of his neighbors and friends, all of whom are joining us live in person in this lecture hall, Message to those of you on Zoom who are not here in person, you could, you could be here um, uh, to help us inaugurate this special lectureship. Before David begins, I want to uh, invite you to come up right now and receive the John Sullivan Memorial Lectureship plaque. Why don't you come into camera angle here? Got it a few times? Yeah. Uh, and it says um, the John F. Sullivan MD Memorial Lectureship in Neuropsychiatry presented to David L. Perez MD September 22nd, 2022. Congratulations on being our inaugural, our inaugural lecture. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just honored to be here. Uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to celebrate. John Sullivan, and really to celebrate all of you in terms of your visionary work in your So our topic today is functional neurological disorder. And as Professor Benjamin mentioned, a topic that uh, Dr. Sullivan was uh, a key expert and um, uh, certainly someone I've also had the opportunity to learn from. So These are my disclosures. And I really highlighted that actually the American Neuropsychiatric Association is this wonderful community of neurologists, psychiatrists, neuropsychologists. It's in large part where I fell in love with the interface of brain, mind, and body. And this is the tradition that's rich here at the University of Massachusetts. In my neck of the woods, some of you may be less familiar with the name Stanley Cobb. Stanley Cobb was a neurologist who went on to establish the first department of psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And there are now named Stanley Cobb chairs in all the major Harvard teaching hospitals. And it turns out that Stanley Cobb was deeply interested in brain, mind, body problems. Here's a telling quote. I solved the mind, body problem by stating, there is no such problem. There are of course many problems concerning the mind, in the body, in all the intermediate levels of integration of the nervous system. However, what I wish to emphasize is there is no problem of mind versus body because biologically no such dichotomy can be made. The dichotomy is an artifact. There is no truth to it. And the discussion has no place in science in 1943. A striking quote, very forward thinking, we still have some room to realize this vision, but hopefully all of us today can move this vision forward. One that really seeks to integrate physical health and mental health. And I want to argue that functional neurological disorder is really the hallmark condition that challenges this artificial dichotomy. So let's make sure that as we begin, that we're on the same page in terms of terminology. So I use the term functional neurological disorder I'll abbreviate this as FND. This is the term that's been widely adopted by the international community, including a range of patient advocacy groups. It's synonymous with the longer term functional neurologic symptom disorder and also synonymous with conversion disorder. Of note, at least in a range of different academic circles, the term conversion disorder has fallen out of favor, in part because it implicates a very specific mechanism that may be relevant for some patients, but likely not relevant for all. So how do we think about this entity of FMD 2020? 
Well, it's no longer a diagnosis of exclusion, but rather it's a rule in diagnosis based on leveraging neuropsychiatric and neurological expertise to identify physical signs and examination and simulological features that are specific for this diagnostic entity. There was one other major change in the DSM-5, among others, and they removed the requirement for the need to identify proximal stress. Now, this population tells their story initially in physical ways. They don't necessarily tell their story in front in psychologically informed, affectively latent ways. Sometimes they get there over the course of their journey, but it can't be required for diagnosis. Secondly, adverse life events are not endorsed by all patients. So it's non specific for the diagnosis. As we think about terminology, I think it's important to also briefly make a statement about two conditions that sometimes are confused for functional neurology. There's another diagnostic category of somatic symptom disorder. Here, patients have a range of somatic complaints, pain, fatigue, GI distress, and the rule-in formulation is a cognitive behavioral therapy one, one where the clinician identifies that unhelpful thought patterns, behaviors, and emotional reactions are amplifying or perpetuating their physical symptoms. If a patient does not have a comorbid F and D, or comorbid neurologic condition, their neurologic examination should be normal in this entity. So that's one diagnostic distinction. And then there's this third category of illness anxiety disorder, previously regarded as hypochondriasis. Here, the main complaint is prominent health anxiety around having or about to receive, about to um, become ill with a new medical condition generally in the setting of relatively low-grade somatic symptoms, when the health anxiety itself is the chief complaint. Sometimes these conditions of F and D, somatic symptom disorder, and health anxiety coexist, but in many cases, they're similar. Okay, so now on to our topic at hand, which is this notion of functional neurological disorder. I think one of the things that's really striking over the past several decades is how prevalent this condition is. As physicians, we encounter this in the emergency department, in our acute hospital admission, and certainly in the outpatient setting. In some epidemiology work from the UK, there's a notion that potentially this referral is second only to headache in outpatient neurology departments. So it's striking. And I think that this audience is the perfect audience to highlight this, which is they're knocking on neurology's door but they really should also be knocking on neuropsychiatry and psychiatry before. And that's why we want to make those intersections as seamless as possible. Not only is it prevalent, but it's costly. This is a big problem, neglected for decades. Yet, this study suggested that $1.2 billion is spent in healthcare expenditures in the emergency room and in the acute hospital setting per year. This rivals major complex neuropsychiatric conditions. Much of the content that I'm covering here today has uh, come from academic outputs that we've published in the Journal of Neuropsychiatry and Clinical Neuroscience and a summary statement in the British Journal, uh, British Medical Journal earlier this year. So as we take a clinical focus to think about how to assess and care for this population. There are three themes I want to highlight for you. The first is in our clinical assessment, we want to confirm the diagnosis using a rule and approach. We want to remain vigilant about relevant medical or neurologic comorbidities that it may have been undercharacterized, including, for example, that one in five patients with functional seizures also had epileptic seizures. And the third notion that's so critical for psychiatry is that diagnosis alone does not equal a treatment. That's where the biopsychosocial formulation and putting the patient in context is so critical. So I've begun to elucidate some of the challenges that I see so often, certainly in our own institution as well. And that is that for neurology, what we use to diagnose 
doesn't equal a simplified treatment. This is the gap. Also for psychiatry, well versed in the biopsychosocial formulation, the gap is in part that at least a range of psychiatrists, some of you have tremendous expertise, um, don't have a playbook for how to assess and manage and conceptualize neurologic symptoms. So across the board, there are challenges. But let's think about how to approach this population from an integrated perspective. And we need to meet the patient where they're at. This is a group presenting with limb weakness, tremor, speech output challenges, seizure, walking problems. So let's start there. Let's start with the natural history of their cheek complaint. So I understand Mr. or Mrs. Jones, you've been struggling with walking trouble and tremors. When did this begin? Get a sense of the tempo and evolution of their symptoms. Did symptoms come on very suddenly with a high rate of severity in a short time? That tempo and evolution is certainly the tempo for neurologic emergencies. It's also the tempo for functional neurologics. As we think about their chief complaint, whether it be seizures or weakness, many patients have mixed symptoms. But what's critical up front is that you, as you get a sense of their chief complaints, ask about what else is traveling neurologically with these symptoms. They have seizures, but also sometimes have a multi-day period of limb weakness or walking trouble. Are they complaining of cognitive clouding, potentially independent of their seizures? Do they have widespread body pain or prominent fatigue? The reason behind this is if you do an elegant seizure focused evaluation in this population and deliver the diagnosis, the patient may say, Doctor, you've been very thoughtful today and I appreciate your patience, but I think you're missing something. I hear you on the seizures, but you know, my thinking's off periodically. I hurt all over. Uh, I'm tired all the time. Just haven't covered that. I think there's something else going on. So that holistic focus on the full range of physical symptoms is critical. Sometimes there can be clinical clues in the history. And so, for example, patients, very severe presentation, who then also endure spontaneous remissions. Three to four months of a good period. Clues, not specific, but potentially um, uh, relevant for raising your index of suspicion of what may be happening. The other notion in the history is when you think about symptom onset, Ask about triggers. And what we've recognized over the past several decades is while sometimes there is a psychologically latent trigger, oftentimes there's a physical trigger. That mild traumatic brain injury, that peripheral limb injury, developing symptoms post surgery or post anesthesia. What's interesting here is that it's drawing attention to the body that occurs in the context of these physical triggers. That's a relevant mechanism as opposed to direct physical injury. Really common. For patients who have symptoms that come and go, one can assess triggers, but also inquire about warning or buildup. This can be, for example, very common in patients with functional seizures who won't endorse unless you directly ask, but when you directly ask, they have heart racing, shortness of breath, nausea, some cognitive clouding, a range of panic like symptoms before their functions. This is a survey of a thousand patients who self-identify as having a functional neurological disorder published by colleagues in the UK earlier this year. It really highlights that 93% endorsed fatigue, 81% reported memory trouble, 70% had headache. And you can see a high degree of heterogeneity, interestingly enough, for their physical motor symptoms as well as a high degree of heterogeneity for idiopathic psychiatric comorbidities. It's worth emphasizing again, as you wear your neurology, neuropsychiatry hat in assessing that chief complaint about the vigilance for assessing an appropriate, uh, a present um, comor a comorbidity that may be present that's relevant and needs to be identified. There's a literature to suggest, for example, that a subset of patients Parkinson's disease have a functional tremor. 
where some individuals with multiple sclerosis will have functional limb weakness. You can think about the treatment planning for a patient with a functional tremor and Parkinson's disease being rather different than a patient with an isolated functional tremor without that relevant neurological Okay, in our clinical program, we assess the neurologic symptoms in about 15 to 20 minutes. And we make two deliberate transitions. The first of which is to get to know the patient as a person. It's really important. So Mr. and Mrs. Jones, if it's okay, I'd like to shift topics for a little bit. Help me to get to know you. Where did you grow up? Who was part of your family growing up? What was life for you as a young child? These open-ended questions can be very helpful. They leave the opportunity for both positive experiences and potentially adverse experiences to be raised. We certainly cover the, gap, the gamut of developmental history, educational history, work history. In this population, litigation and workman's compensation can be relevant. Um, substance use. And we sensitively ask about life experiences, uh, including uh, physical and sexual abuse as a child and other traumatic experiences in the moment. Really important to ask sensitively. You all know how to do this. The other piece is some patients are rather guarded in going there. That's where I think the importance of transparency can help to. Say, so, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, you know, this may or may not be relevant. These are questions we ask all patients. Sometimes these kinds of questions can be relevant. Would it be okay if I asked you a little bit more about potentially challenging life experiences? And then you go ahead and go. They say no, you might explain your rationale, but stop. There'll be time to go there more if need be in the future. You may also make a mental note, by the way, that your uh, trauma-focused psychiatric screen potentially may be compromised if you're not given certain information. I'll tell you in our framing where we focus on physical symptoms, where we're non-dualistic, where we really integrate, where we're transparent in sharing with the patient where we're going next, it's only a handful of patients who really push back. But this certainly comes up and you need to have a playbook for it when it comes up. We, I personally find that getting to know the person and putting their history in context is a great way to go after the physical and the, the cheap the physical um, the clinical inter interview around their um, physical symptoms. But you can certainly start with a psychiatric screen if you find that that's more helpful. We do that in the third phase and we'll transition again transparent. So, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, would it be okay if we switch topics again? Tell me, how have you been feeling emotionally? Now, I'll tell you that I begin that conversation this way and I did not use that kind of language when I trained in psychiatry. But I've evolved this kind of language where I find that it's neutral. And again, tell me how you've been doing emotion opens the opportunity for both. Maybe they've been doing very well or not that bad given the circumstances. Or maybe they've been doing pretty darn well. And then I'm going to share that with you. And then we um, run the gamut of mood, anxiety, trauma related disorders. Think about asking for OCD and eating disorders. And certainly a sensitive PTSD screen can be important as well. I'll also share with you while I've highlighted that there's a neurologic differential to keep in mind, psychiatric differential to keep in mind too. I've been referred patients for suspected functional neurological disorder who had somatic symptoms. And actually when I probe further, I worry that they were in the prodromal stages of idiopathic psychotic spectrum disturbance. And six months to 12 months later, they developed a frank schizophrenia-like presentation. So keep these things in mind. And that's why leveraging your psychiatry expertise, mm -hmm. colleague to colleague, is so important. Okay, you're going to round out the rest of your typical intake in terms of past medical, medications, allergies, family history, generally as you would any other typical case. And now I want to state as clear as I can that everything we've just covered is non specific for a diagnosis of functional neurology. It can raise the index of suspicion. It's critical for treatment planning. None of it gives you the diagnosis. So now let's highlight for a bit in a series of videos, what are the kinds of features on neurologic examination 
that you want to look for to make this diagnosis with high specificity. And before I start showing you the videos, I want to uh, digress for one moment and make the point, we want the ruled in signs to be robust. We want them to be obvious. We don't want them to be subtle. In our institution, when we uh, put F and D on the map in a new and potentially more integrative way, one of the challenges that came up is actually that when I was on service, over and over again, I was finding that I was actually educating the resident across psychiatry neurology. The diagnosis was not that. And that's in part because they were asking the question, maybe there's a little bit of variability in the strategy. Maybe there was an element of training. That maybe is nonspecific. Keep looking for other diagnoses and bring in a colleague with expertise to chime in as well and give you a second opinion. So now let me show you what we characterize as robust rule in signs. We're going to start with a functional tremor, highlighting variability and distress. Here, this patient has a postural and rest tremor of their right hand and arm and they're gonna engage in a competing motor movement where they tap their left thigh. Now there's complete resolution of that functional tremor. Robust, obvious. Let's talk about this phenomena of tremor entrainment. So a patient presents with a given rhythm to their functional tremor. And it turns out that while patients experience their functional tremor as involuntary, it's engaging volitional cortical spinal tract pathways. So what you can do is introduce a competing movement, one that also engages volitional cortical spinal tract pathways, and it will hijack the rhythm of a functional tremor. So here is that, here's an example of that here. I'll let it play again because it goes fast in the beginning. And as it plays again, you'll see that there's kind of an irregular frequency to the patient's tremor. You start tapping, and now there's time lock. Here's a video of a patient showing a multiplicity of signs, more severe in severity, but frankly, rather typical of what we see in our clinical program. Here you all see it. You're a high amplitude postural tremor. Six, six, Cognitive seven, distraction in this case is not working. Sometimes it will be helpful. Now there's finger tapping. Notice that the high amplitude postural tremor initially went away. Now there's time locked movements with the finger tapping. So you're seeing elements of variability and distractibility, as well as elements of entrainment. Here with ballistic finger movements, there's a brief pause in the tremor. Again, that brief pause is a sign of a variable and distractible functional tremor. Okay, let's move on to other phenotypes. There's a nice um, series of videos published in Neurology in 2020 from Mark Hallett and colleagues. And I wanna show you some of those videos now. Here's a patient who presented with sudden knee buckling type gait. And this video is going to show you what we call motor uh, inconsistency. That knee buckling goes away when the patient dances in the office. And that knee buckling goes away when they hop on one foot or hop on the other. Okay. Should we take another step? Okay. Now, do first position, do round de jambe. Okay, can you do en dedans? Uh, what? En dedans. Also interesting is sometimes in order of consistency, those strength, those strength of the patient. hop on one foot. On their body. <clears throat> How about the other foot? In fact, one of the um, arguments that's made is we show patients their signs on examination. 
it's a great way to begin to engage their buy into the diagnosis and talk about what's happening. The signs are repeatable over and over again. If they fluctuate and stop and start going away, especially early on in that educational period, think about a differential diagnosis of what might be happening. Okay, non-economical compensatory movements. Here is this notion that balance is objectively uh, observed to be better than the patient subjectively reports. And what you're going to see in this video is a patient doing heel-toe walking. Initially, they fall over uh, slightly and hold on to the wall. But then you're going to demonstrate exquisite balance by swaying left and right on one foot, but not the wall. Demonstrating to us as we watch that in fact, balance and coordination are quite preserved. So a non-specific gait difficulty initially, here's where they need to hold on to the wall. Now watch what happens. Swing left and right, but with exquisite balance. Another phenotype, dragging monoplegic gait. The leg drags behind the individual as if an inanimate object, oftentimes coupled with functional limb weakness in that same leg. Here you'll see an example of this, but interestingly enough, that this patient's example also has comorbid Parkinson's. Really just to highlight that in some patients, there can be significant neuropsychiatric complexity. That dragging leg on the right is dragging monoplegic gait. That will transition to functional dystonia. And this particular presentation overlaps in part with what people will confuse for a functional facial weakness or a, a, a potential facial droop. So we see this in the emergency room where patients present with hyperactivation of their platysma with jaw deviation to the right and functional limb weakness in their arm and leg. But rather than it being a droop, what you'll notice is it's really pulling of the face to one side. And you'll see this in the video. Mimic of a facial droop in the form of... In the last few weeks, as it's got better, I think in the mornings and things, it's not as bad, but yeah. as the day wears on and if I get tired or stressed it, it tends to come back so it's probably more intermittent now yep. than it used okay. to be although it was there all the time previously all right show me your teeth and just try and keep your mouth in that position you know sort of show me your teeth position and then relax and that does seem to have made it a little bit worse can you have a look? Can you feel the contraction? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Just show it. me where you feel it contracting. Yeah, I feel it here. Yeah. And then it starts to come down here. Yeah. Now, I'm happy to say out loud that functional dystonia is among the more complicated phenotypes of affinita diagnosed and appendage. If dystonic symptoms are presenting in isolation, really a great opportunity to bring in your expert movement disorder colleague to leverage their expertise. But there are phenotypes that are specific for functional dystonia. Fixed dystonia being one of them. For example, in the top left portion of the slide, with a plantar flexion and inversion of the foot, um, patients present with really a, a striking fixed pattern there. And that is the hallmark of a functional dystonia in their lower limb. As we think about more common presentations, apart from functional movement, there's in the hyperkinetic, hypokinetic sense, there's also functional limb weakness. The most classic sign to illustrate this on exam is the Hoover sign. Let me just walk you through this for a moment in kind of the way that's a bit more updated than the way it's classically taught. Imagine that the patient sitting in the chair reports left leg weakness, and you have your hand underneath their weak left leg. You ask them to push downward you can readily lift up their weak left leg, verifying in part that they seemingly appear weak. Okay, now draw their attention to the right. Have them flex their strong right leg, keeping your uh, hand underneath 
they are previously weaker. When we flex one side of our body, there's contralateral extension. The pr principle of synergistic contraction. And what you'll find in instances of a positive mover sign is now there's excellent downward push in their left leg. In fact, it's so excellent you can't lift up their previously weak left leg. This is a sign again of functional limb movements. Analogous to the Hoover sign is also the hip abductor sign. You test abduction, having the individual push out their apparently weak left leg. And when you test one limb at a time, you can appreciate that there's apparent weakness with your ability to push their left leg inward. Now test abduction bilaterally. And it's that bilateral test that activates the principle of synergistic contraction again. And now there's full strength in abduction bilaterally. Okay. Um, as we think about functional weakness, I also want to mention briefly for you all collapsing giveaway weakness. So here when we're testing confrontation testing at the bedside, you may test deltoid strength and find that for a moment they're strong and then their arm or leg seems to collapse underneath your testing. Collapsing giveaway weakness is a specific sign for functional weakness with one exception. And that is asking the individuals in pain. And we wanna be cautious to not confuse pain limited weakness or functional weakness. So oftentimes I'll ask, does it hurt? Are you able to push through for two seconds, even if it hurts a little bit? And you'll find that that pain limited weakness or that collapsing weakness has now resolved itself. And that there is no evidence of functional weakness in that. So we've covered functional movement disorder, functional limb weakness, now on to a few statements about functional seizures, also termed psychogenic non -epilepsy. Now, the semiology here can also help you make the diagnosis. For example, individuals with functional seizures will have events with tight eye closure and seizure onset. Very different than eyes open with eye deviation and tonic posturing that you might see in some forms of epileptic seizure. In terms of the motor semiologies, side to side head or truncal movements, often asynchronous, are also features that suggest functional seizures. Now, for a range of, of phenotypes that I've covered this far, we're making clinically established diagnoses based on our neuropsychiatric expertise. But for functional seizures, we can do one better. We can capture typical convulsive events on video EEG with the aim of making a documented diagnosis, the highest level of certainty. Yes, good, good. Keep blowing. It's definitely going to come again. Your initial is bicycle movement. They may make you think about frontal lobe epilepsy. Now there's a stuttering movement. Tremulous movements in the legs bilaterally. The bicycle movements return, but with a lower frequency. You can't see it so well on video, but the patient's eyes are tightly shut. And apart from motor artifact, the patient's EEG before, during, and afterwards lack an electrographic record, confirming and documenting the diagnosis. I've highlighted this terminology here. I'll just point out the LaFrance 2013 epilepsy article is a great resource to use this um, language in terms of levels of diagnostic certainty. Okay, in terms of these features, as you elicit them on exam, we are no longer tricking patients or using these tools and seeing if we can somehow uncover what's going on, but rather, we have a nuanced toolkit of a range of examination techniques. And in a given patient, you may reach for um, eliciting variable distractible tremors or a tremor that entrains. And when you see these features, point them out. Transparent, really engaging the patient around a curiosity around their physical symptoms. You're going to come back to this 
and highlight what you appreciate as the rationale behind how you're making the diagnosis. Okay, before communicating the diagnosis, which is really the first step in treatment, oftentimes in our clinical evaluation, we'll pause after the exam and I will re-review their past history. I want to confirm that that seizure that I saw on video or maybe that I witnessed in the office today is the same kind of seizure captured as part of their epilepsy monitoring workup several months prior. I'll make sure that in terms of pain and fatigue, uh, that they've had an appropriate workup. Have they had an ANA? Have they had an ESR, a CRP? Has someone looked at a TSH, an Lyme antibody, for example? Really just being cautious, in part because patients with widespread body pain I certainly ordered an ANA and it comes back positive at 1 to 2,580. And while they may have a functional movement disorder, it sounds like potentially in this patient's case, their equation for overload may be an underdiagnosed rheumatologic condition. But assuming that the workup has been uh, comprehensive and thorough, that the rule in signs are robust, it's now an opportunity to communicate with the principal. And what's really important here is that there has been a bit of a paradox. It's generally not so helpful to lead with all of the good news. Their exams have been um, unrevealing, their brain MRI is healthy, the EEG doesn't show epilepsy. In part because the patient's life is in this way. They have been struggling, they're out of work, they're in a wheelchair. They're not looking for good news. They're looking for answers in terms of what's going on because they're really, really strong. So the sort of new way of delivering this diagnosis is transparently the way we deliver other diagnoses. Based on your history and specifically what we saw in exam, you have a functional tremor. That's a kind of functional neurological disorder. This is real, common, and treatments are available. <clears throat> have you heard about functional neurologic disorder Many patients have. And that's an opportunity also to share with them. We think of functional neurological disorder as a condition that lives in between neurology and psychiatry. But I want to be clear. I don't think in any way, shape, or form you're crazy. And you're certainly not making up your story. Again, that kind of language I didn't use when I was in psychiatry training. I can't tell you how much affect it brings in the room when I mention that I don't think you're crazy. I advocate its use, frankly, because um, week in, week out, I really see that it can be a point of um, having the patient feel connected. There are excellent vignettes on how to communicate this diagnosis amongst a range of challenges. And this um, article by Alan Carson and colleagues in Practical Neurology is a great read. Also, if you haven't been to neurosymptoms.org, so this is a core educational resource. It's been translated into a range of languages. There are also some really nice two, three minute videos around what is the diagnosis? How is it treated? Is this all in my head, doctor? Well, it's all in your brain. We're non dualistic, right? Brain and body, uh, uh, mind and brain really are one. And um, a range of these kinds of questions can be tackled very nicely with um, the educational materials on neurosymptoms. I'll say a little bit more about how I communicate this because I think it's such a critical point. There are a range of analogies that are proposed, thinking of functional logic symptoms as the hardware being healthy, the software is crashing. That can be helpful. Sometimes we'll frame it as a form of brain, mind, body overload. Whether you use the software crashing analogy, whether you use the brain, mind, body overload analogy or some other analogy, what I find is that I engage the patient in a conversation around, let's be curious together around what goes into your personal equation for developing a functional logical disorder. That personal equation piece, I find really critical, in part because, for example, maybe a given patient's personal equation is they have obsessive compulsive personality disorder. They are high functioning all the time. They're go, go, go at 120%. Those patients sometimes develop a functional level. 
And some of those features may be relevant in their personal data. That same patient may not endorse a history of childhood maltreatment or other prominent life experiences. So you can see how not present, potentially not relevant, but let's think about what is relevant for your given case, leaving you with this notion of you're in search of that personal equation and really carrying it forward longitudinally. So now as you've done this assessment and as you've communicated the diagnosis, one of the potentially uh, more advanced skills is your own internal dialogue. How did it go? Does the patient seem to be receptive and saying, okay, so I hear you. So you think functional weakness or functional seizures. Okay, well, how do I get better from this talk? And there's seemingly good buy-in and good awareness. You may proceed with a patient-centered conversation around treatment. Maybe as you started the conversation around diagnosis, they started to dissociate. Maybe they started to have a functional seizure. Or maybe they became symptomatic in some other way. That patient may need more time. Maybe they're saying, Doc, you've been very patient and I appreciate um, your explanations, but I just feel that in a nice way, you're saying this is all in my hand and I'm making it up. And that's really where you want to take a step back, ask them what they heard you say, and do a little bit of continued education. For that patient who's raising major doubts, you may say, look, why don't you spend some time reading that information on neurosymptoms.org? Why don't you review some of the patient testimonials? And why don't you come back and see me in clinic in a month or two? And we can talk about your opinion around this diagnosis and see if we might want to move forward with treatment recommendations. But moving forward with treatment recommendations, even to anyone who might be the top expert, will fall flat if you don't think about your level of buy-in and early engagement. The other piece is, so how did it go with communication of the diagnosis? That's one piece. And what travels with their FMD is the second piece. That is the second piece that we do internally. What's your formulation of this case? Is this a case with intellectual disability and functional seizures? You may think about how they may, that may affect semi-manualized cognitive behavioral therapy referrals, for example. This is a patient with classic F and D, but they're about to lose their housing. They have no transportation. Life is in prominent disarray. You may want to think about targeting that area of social difficulty as really your first pass into thinking about good treatment for their functional logical disorder. If you're going to hold off on CBT, you're going to hold off on physical rehabilitation. They need to be able to get it to the door or even log on to the computer for virtual care. And there are a range of other formulations that really uh, keep us on our toes with this population. Okay, as we, uh, I want to make sure we leave time for questions. So I'm covering treatments a bit fast, but I'll hit some highlights. Assuming that buy-in is good, and after you've made your um, uh, clinical formulation in your own mind, the two mainstays of treatment are physical treatments or physical problems, PT, OT, and speech and language therapy. The other mainstay of treatment is psychotherapy, the best evidence being for skills-based psychotherapy like cognitive behavioral therapy. <clears throat> but your formulation may teach you about reasons to deviate from that. Including, for example, maybe the patient has functional seizures, chronic PTSD, and the flashbacks trigger their functional seizures. Think about a trauma-focused psychotherapy in such instances. And there are many other um, uh, variations in that. There are consensus recommendations now written by physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech and language therapists that you wanna make sure your therapist that you're referring to are aware of and are using these principles. There are also published manuals for cognitive behavioral therapy. The manual that we base our own clinical psychotherapy treatment program on is this manual, Overcoming Functional Logic Symptoms, a five area approach. For the trainees in the room interested in cognitive behavioral therapy and growing their playbook to work with this population, it's a terrific read. I have no connection to it, but it's available for a modest cost uh, on Amazon and other publications. Kurt LaFrance, as you know, has published manuals in functional seizures. 
And I'll wrap up there really just by thanking you all for this opportunity. And I'm keen to see what questions you have. It's been a pleasure. Dr. Perez, that was uh, really magnificent. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a lot of people on the line, um, well over 100, uh, more than that actually. And uh, a lot of them are alumni and uh, people in the psychiatry community, and they're asking some really tough questions. Are you ready? Okay. Um, this one actually comes from Dr. Crennan here in neurology at UMass. Um, he wants you to comment on different speech abnormalities in uh, functional disorders and whether you have any clues to differentiate them from non-functional speech disorders. Wonderful question. Um, uh, so in, there are several phenotypes for functional speech disorders. These include functional stutter, they include um, onset of infantile speech, and also foreign accents. One of the main features to look for there, for example, in functional stutter, we can think about stutter as a developmental disorder, but you don't typically develop a new onset stutter at 40 years of age. So the, the, on, the timing of onset can be important. And then they'll exhibit functional stutter, but with distraction, they'll be able to engage in several sentences of highly articulate speech. So you can use those features of variability and distractibility to make a diagnosis of functional speech disorders. Um, Dr. Abramowitz, one of our neuropsychiatry alumni at University of Hawaii, um, wants to know how often you see tremors with mixed features, for example, Parkinsonian rescue tremor, but that also has distractibility. Great question. So I don't have the answer in terms of the actual frequency. I will say that there's an article in the JNNP, a senior author is Alberto Espe, and that article was among the first in characterizing the overlap between the Parkinson's disease and the functional neurologic symptoms. So it could be a good read. That might be a place to start. Um, another one of our neuropsychiatry alumni, Dr. New at Vanderbilt University, um, wants to know your thoughts about frontal seizures with foci too deep to be picked up on the standard scalp EEG. Great. And I assume many tricks to differentiate them from that. Uh, Great question, Dr. New. Um, you probably noticed that I said this very fast when I pointed out motor, um, uh, convulsive motor seizures. Uh, as really being um, able to be diagnosed by video EG. So a full body shaking event that's driven by an epileptic seizure is incompatible with the EEG showing uh, a lack of epileptic form activity. But as you point out very nicely, there are other semiologies that may not have electrographic signatures, but nonetheless could be epileptic seizures. And those signatures but by that being that they're not gonna be found on surface EGs. From the um, email signature, I believe this question to be coming from a chief resident of ours from about 15 years ago, uh, who is someplace in the Midwest. Uh, many times we hear patients talking about a seizure that may or may not have been a seizure, actually, after the fact, without access to any video of the event. Their exam is now normal. Sometimes they're worried it'll happen again. Any suggestions you have for patients to look for to be proactive about when it might happen again and what they should do? Great question. So um, this is actually a good teaching point around patients presenting to the emergency room or in one given setting, exhibiting functional neurologic signs. Document that with severity. I can't tell you the number of cases but we get referred where patients reported to have limb weakness, there's four out of five motor strength pattern of weakness documented, but there is no specific language to the functional signs that we need to make that diagnosis. Then they come in clinic and their exam is normal. So for functional seizures, um, have the individual first focus on safety, but second, focus on trying to capture an event on video using their phone. This is very, very helpful. It's a great suggestion. Another one of our neurologists here at EMAS, Dr. Mitchell, uh, is asking you, an impossible question. I'm asking, oh, we don't have an FND clinic here. Uh, so what should neurologists do to refer FND patients for appropriate outpatient treatment since we don't got it? Great question. <laughs> uh, back in 2014, Mass General didn't have it either. And most places don't have it. I think the, the, the short answer is, this is a very common 
right? So whether you are referring to a specialized clinic or not, um, a range of different clinicians across neurology, psychiatry, emergency medicine are going to see this population. And I'll argue even that the future of care is likely not referring to a tertiary F&D center or not. It's developing local care. Many patients can respond very well to some of the interventions I've described. So how do you do this? And I'm sure that all of you frankly know how to do this because we have experts here in the room, but um, team build. And how did we start? So when I um, arrived in 2014, I gave lectures to our physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists. I'm not a therapist or an expert in any of those areas. We traded notes. And they actually came to me and said, you know, Dr. Perez, we've been seeing this for years. We've just had nobody to talk to about this. Same thing for behavioral health and psychologists and social workers. I gave lectures on this. They are exceedingly more expert than me in psychotherapy, but they didn't know about the published manuals. And when I use some language such as, well, think about the functional seizure, like what you would do for panic attacks with prominent association. Do you have a playbook for that? And the therapist is like, oh, of course I do. So there's some subtle tricks where really you can leverage wonderful resources to suddenly make a clinic overnight. But there's certainly challenges along the way. I'm going to try to get two more questions in just under the wire here. Uh, Dr. Safar at Leahy Clinic, who you know, um, uh, is asking about a tricky one when FND is cognitive. So do you have any thoughts about do's and don'ts when evaluating a patient who has possible cognitive form disorder? Laura, great question. Thank you for listening in. Um, you know, I think that there is an article published in Brain in 2020 or 2021. Um, operationalizing the diagnostic criteria for functional cognitive disorder. This is likely going to be added as a subtype of FND in the DSM in the years to come. You look for striking internal inconsistency. So, for example, the patient reports prominent memory trauma, but they tell you one on one in exquisitely organized detail all the items that they're forgetting. That's not what a patient with a genetic MCI or Alzheimer's disease does. In fact, they're in the clinic saying, I'm not sure if I'm here, I have a bit of memory trouble, I think. And then they're looking to their partner, right? So um, this is, these are some clues. Um, and here it is, the final question, which is I think an advertisement for your biological psychiatry seminar with the residents this afternoon. Um, our intern neurology, Dr. Silver, says, great presentation. Are you aware of the biomarkers like imaging or serological markers that might aid in diagnosis. Dr. Silver, stay tuned. I think um, uh, in short, we're uh, focusing on the pathophysiology of this at 115. I will say that about 80% of my work is actually research focused on identifying brain symptom severity, brain disease risk, and brain prognosis relationship. Um, I was just having conversations earlier about now we're thinking about biological subtypes of functional neurological disorder, including potentially a um, trauma subtype. I'll make one comment about biomarkers, which is that I don't believe the future of biomarkers in this field is that the multimodal brain MRI is going to beat Dr. Benjamin in making this better. But I think the gap is, is that we're not sure what patients are going to respond to what treatments. So biomarkers predicting treatment response and biologically subtyping groups because they have clinical relevance is where I think the future will be. Thank you very much to our faculty and alumni and greater neuropsychiatry community out there on Zoom. And thank you, Dr. Perez, for an inspiring talk. Maybe one of our trainees is going to found the FND clinic here after this. Um, thanks very much. And thanks very much to Dr. Sullivan's family and friends for helping us make this lecture possible.